1992, but it has never been aired. And in fact, it is part one of a four-part series that was never aired anywhere. And uh, it's pretty old. It's an interview with Vladimir Terzisky, and it's about space and UFOs and all that kind of stuff. So once again, tonight's broadcast of The Hour of the Time was originally taped on July 27, 1992, as part one of a four-part series of interviews with Vladimir Terzisky. This series was never aired on The Hour of the Time, or anywhere for that matter. Nobody has ever heard this before. So sit back, relax. I don't even remember what it is, except that it covers tonight's topic. July 27th, 1992. I am your host, William Cooper. just turned in, ladies and gentlemen. This is a broadcast that was originally taped in a hotel room in San Diego, as a matter of fact, on July 27, 1992, as a four-part series of interviews with Vladimir Terzisky. This series was never aired anywhere. Nobody has ever heard it before. And aside from remembering that it has to do with tonight's space topic, I don't really remember what it's about. So we should all enjoy listening to this tape, and if tonight is productive, we'll do the whole series for the next three Friday nights. again, welcome to the hour of the time, the only hour that ever was, ever will be, or that ever is. This is the hour during which you will decide your future 
and thus our collective futures. Tonight we have a very special guest with us, and we're going to be talking about suppressed technology that was developed many years ago and has been kept hidden from the general population of not only this country, but the world. We've talked a little bit about this on other episodes of the Hour of the Time, but tonight we're going to go back to the origins. Uh, we're going to talk about it in depth, where it came from, who's developed it, is it real, is it not real. And by now, those of you who have been listening to this show for some time probably have realized that once again we're going to talk about UFOs. I first met this gentleman uh, during my lecture tours several years ago when I began to notice that right in front of my podium in the first row, the same gentleman seemed to be following me around the country and always had very penetrating questions to ask. Uh, we eventually uh, struck up conversation, got to know each other, uh, and I found that behind the beard was uh, a very good brain that was working all the time. Some of his research has paralleled mine, uh, and uh, he certainly knows a lot more about some parts of this mystery than I do. And that's what we want to get at tonight. We want to sort of pick his brain and uh, get to what he knows about this mystery called UFOs. His name is Vladimir Trzyski, and he is originally from Bulgaria. And uh, Vladimir, welcome to the Hour of the Time. Thank you very much, Bill. I'm very happy to be a part of this great show, probably one of the best shows on the West Coast. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely uh, a non-American show without any commercials, intellectual show that would make people to think something that seldom happens here. More easily one can find such a show in Europe, for example. Well, you know a lot about that because you come from a country that was traditionally, uh, you weren't allowed to have any uh, freedom of speech at all, were you? And that's exactly how we learn to look for good shows. We would listen to Radio Moscow, we would listen to Radio Vatican, to the BBC, to Voice of America, to Deutsche Welle, and we would compare their versions of the story. And this is how people in Eastern Europe learn the ABC of practical conspiratology, how the lies are put together with white threads. Never ever the versions are totally uh, coincidental. Always there would be a little difference. Uh -huh. How did you uh, get to be in the United States? What, what brought you here, Vladimir? Well, I came as a political refugee in 85. Uh, spent a year in a refugee camp in Vienna. Studied German at the Vienna University at the time, uh, waiting for my visa. Arrived in Arizona in 85, studied one year of sociology at the Arizona State University and continued for two more years at uh, UCLA. But uh, what brought me here was my dissatisfaction with my own country uh, after spending four years of studies in Japan. I studied physics and engineering at Tokai University from 74 to 1980. Uh, coming back from Japan into an Eastern European country and Bulgaria in particular fights with Romania for the place before the last place in Europe, just ahead of Albania, is the least developed uh, European country. So the shock, the cultural and technological shock would be tremendous for someone coming back from Japan into such country. Certainly. Uh, let's uh, get into the, to the subject of tonight's um, talk. Where in history have you found the first real technology that may have led to what we now call unidentified flying objects, flying saucers, UFOs, um, all these different names that people have labeled these things that, that we see in the air. Well, Bill, just with three sentences, my interest in UFOs was uh, uh, exploded while I was in Japan. Japan is an extremely open society about UFOs. On prime time television, one would see documentary films that would never be shown in the United States from all over the world, from Australia, from the United States, from Europe. Uh, and being an engineer and being fascinated uh, as a small 
child with aviation, I developed a very deep interest into the anti-gravity part of the UFO equation. How the hell do these things fly? I remember the first ever volume of the encyclopedia I picked up when my father subscribed for the great Russian, for the great Soviet encyclopedia, was the volume on aviation. This was my first encyclopedic search before I ever went to primary school. I was five at the time. I've been fascinated with flying contraptions. So after I developed my interest in UFOs uh, in Japan, that was in the late 70s, after arrival in the United States in 85, I started avidly reading books, journals about UFOs, collecting uh, a vast video library. I have about 200 documentary films about UFOs from all over the world. I'm fluent in Japanese, Russian, German, English, and I can read technical text in some other European languages, so I don't have any problem for using uh, documentaries from these countries. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I heard the first rumors that uh, the Germans had developed some anti-gravity flying machines of a circular or lenticular form that we colloquially call flying saucers. I've been fascinated with anti-gravity before that, and I thought that I have discovered some of the big secrets for the anti-gravity. Uh, uh, subsequently, I realized that the Germans have utilized all these secrets in very simple engineering devices that took off successfully and were tested <coughs> before the war ended. Was there, um, is, is there any hint of this going back farther in history? I know during the 1800s, in the, in the newspaper accounts in the United States, um, there are stories of a giant. Uh, uh, basically, giant. nobody really knows how big this thing was, but it was an airship that went across the country. Go airship. Uh, well, not go, because this thing actually landed. and people got out and talked to people. Uh, it, it can be found in... in, in uh, yeah, that's the label they use about them in the UFO literature. But uh, it's a very important question about how technology is generally developed on a planet. Uh, I'm of the opinion that Secret societies, hermetic sciences, secret brotherhood has been keeping, safekeeping, safeguarding, developing, and using elite knowledge that has not been accessible to the general public for the last five, six thousand years. So I, I would say nothing new under the sun. It is not the Germans that developed anti-gravity first. The first report about a workable flying anti-gravity machine that I heard was of the American John Keeley, a genius of the Tesla and Schauberger type that lived in the late 1800s. In 1860, in the, in the early 1860s, he uh, demonstrated a flying, working, flying anti-gravity platform to the war ministry. Uh, it was a device the size of a bathtub with a lever, control lever sticking on top of it. He put a chair on top of that device, sat in the chair, pulled the lever forward. The device rose silently, noiselessly, then pulled the lever further forward, and it accelerated at tremendous speed horizontally, then stopped at the dime came backwards and landed. All of it noiselessly, uh, Keely never fell off the chair. The chair was not bolted to the device. Uh, the uh, guys from the war ministry scratched their mark heads and said, well, now we don't see any reason for any purpose for this device in the future. <laughs> so this is the story of... Uh, John Keeley is a genius uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a very rare kind. Uh, there's a John Keeley Society in uh, Colorado. Anyone who's interested in this rare literature, I will be glad to provide information later on. Uh, my phone number in Los Angeles is 310-473-9717, and I will repeat it one more at the end of the show. 
But the John Keeley Society provided me with incredible information. Uh, actually, he created a whole science of sympathetic vibration, uh, something that has been later expurged from the libraries. John Keeley, as a name, is not found on, in any database. It's not m mentioned in any library. The guy from the John Keeley Society had discovered uh, copies of some of his drawings uh, that obviously come from a book. They have page numbers, but the book, they've never been able to locate the book itself. The books have been removed by the thought police from the university and other public libraries. They may still be found in some private collections or in some dusty attic. Uh, John Keeley created other things, including free energy devices. He built a 250 horsepower free energy locomotive. He built incredible tunnel digging, tunnel boring devices that were using sound. We can call him the genius of sound vibrations. Through masterful manipulation of sound, one can attain mastery of the lower classes of energies and of matter. Obviously, it's my understanding that there are hierarchical levels of energies in the universe. The few interactions that we know of physics, the four and we speculate about the fifth, the gravitation, the electromagnetic, the weak and the strong interaction, and now physics speculates about the fifth, the opposite of gravitational force. These are just a small fraction of the large number of energies in direction that interaction that exist in the universe. And John Keeley was able somehow to tap to one of these, uh, the magic of sound. Another report that I know of the uh, late and 1800s is, of course, uh, the information coming uh, about uh, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla was another genius of the Keeley and Schauberger type. Uh, someone who would receive his uh, ideas in basically a finished vision. All he had to do is put the idea on paper and then the guys in the shop had to put the paper into metal. And these things were always working. Tesla was assuming that, I'm sorry, Edison was assuming that Tesla never sweated in the shop, in the lab, but this was the nature of his genius. He was getting his ideas somewhere from the upper floors of the universe in a ready form. Anyway, Tesla worked extensively on so many numerous fields of physics, but we can call him the genius of electromagnetics, the mm, oscillating uh, electrical current that we use nowadays is probably the first and the smallest of Tesla inventions that he did in the uh, 1870s, 1880s. What Tesla did after that has been successfully expressed from public libraries uh, his name was have been uh, his name has been downplayed. I've even seen photographs of his image airbrushed away from a photograph uh, of a group of scientists at the Advanced Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, where Einstein happened to be in the same photograph. Obviously, if uh, someone is in the same photograph with Einstein, then he is not just any scientist. He's a major scientist. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my feeling is that uh, the stories about the ghost airships of the late 1800s and, uh, are probably true, that these have been secret engineering uh, projects, let's call them black projects, financed uh, through shady financiers, private financiers, uh, by the bankers and the Illuminati and the secret societies behind the scenes. Uh, the fictional uh, book uh, Genesis and its prequel uh, Inception by Harvinson are, in my opinion, a very true story, in my humble opinion, a true story of how these secret societies develop uh, new technologies uh, that are never divulged to the public, at least for 50 years. Uh, in that story, they have the creation of airships way before the turn of the century. They even mentioned the existence of a turboprop biplane that crossed the Atlantic uh, before the Wright Brothers plane flew. They even intimate that uh, the Tunguska explosion in, I think, 1905 or 1908, somewhere there, was actually an explosion of a crude nuclear-powered 
flying device of a sort of shape that was created by a brilliant American uh, scientist named Wilson. Uh, of course, two-thirds of this fictional novel is about the uh, research and development in anti-gravity and the creation of a large family of uh, flying saucers in Germany before and during the Second World War. Uh, is there, excuse me, but is there any evidence that this, this man Wilson actually lived? This may be uh, this may be a cover up for another real person that lived. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it's a good question to see whether Harbison himself knows German. I have a little suspicion that he just published a brilliant book. He never followed with anything for ten years. Uh, and if he doesn't know German, then it would be obvious for me that he just got this material as a big, thick file from um, somewhere, we all know from where, and he was asked to write one nice book, probably a bestseller, because this is one uh, of the many skeletons in the closet of the secret societies and the government black closet that they won't eventually be taken out to the public, that they want to watch one more piece of dirty laundry. Do you think uh, Genesis may have been something like Minus, Missing Time or, uh, or uh, uh, Majestic uh, by Strieber? Uh, yes, yes, yes. In my opinion, uh, the, the, the book Genesis, because the part of Genesis that I investigated thoroughly, the part about the German flying saucers, uh, turned out to be many times beyond uh, what was discussed in Genesis. I mean, the Genesis was a gross understatement of the German uh, anti-gravity research and development effort. So let's, but let's, let's go to we'll one go more item. Well, one more item. So Tesla is known to have developed anti-gravity uh, using an electromagnetic principle. John Keeley developed anti-gravity using vibrational sound techniques. And I have a suspicion that both of these anti-gravity devices were free energy devices, namely uh, flying transformers of energy that would transform types of energy that we have not discovered, we know very little about yet, into energy that we know about a little bit more and we can use as mechanical work. I mean, uh, electricity or just mechanical work. Uh, so uh, I have a feeling that some of these airships of the late 1800s were the first experimental <coughs> devices utilizing uh, the lift of uh, hydrogen and possibly helium. And I also have a suspicion that they may have had some hybrid anti-gravity drives installed in them because of the strange designs that I see. I tend to believe in drawings when I see them in the paper because people's eyes are a very good uh, optical image processing and uh, data storing mechanism, in my opinion. Uh, early uh, at the turn of the century, there have been many reports, 14 reports, the, the latest of them I read in one of the latest issues of Fate magazine, about flying saucers being noticed in many parts of the United States, landing and people talking in plain American English and wearing Navy uniforms. I have a feeling that these are the first and secret black project anti-gravity vehicles developed with Tesla technology by the Navy, for the Navy, financed by the secret societies and the bankers. So uh, we see a whole line of secret sciences developed. These are not all the secret sciences that are developed by the secret societies. This is less than 5%, less than 1% of the secret sciences that are developed in parallel in faraway farms by shady financiers, uh, uh, by crazy scientists. My feeling is that probably all the films, that science fiction films that we've seen about crazy scientists in Frankenstein in labs are exactly that. Secret black, black projects financed by uh, the international secret society. So by the time the Germans came to power, I have found at least five instances of anti-gravity craft developed on this planet. Uh, the latest instance is uh, the lenticular aerodyne by Henry Coander, Frenchman. Uh, I have an engineering drawing of this device. 
Uh, and I repeat, anyone who's interested in more information can give me a call, write me a letter, and I will send full information, faxes, uh, I mean, zero copies of the drawings and so on. I have several videos on the topic. Coanda uh, Centicular Aerodyne utilize a hybrid helicopter propeller lift and anti-gravity uh, lift. Uh, it was powered by uh, turbojet and ramjet. Uh, it was an invention that preceded its time with at least 10-15 years. So by what, the time... What, what time frame are we talking about? 1930. Okay. Coanda's uh, lenticular aerodyne. And uh, my feeling is that by the time the uh, well, Hitler came to power. It was well established in the scientific community of the secret society that anti-gravity is extremely easy to obtain. That simple spinning of an object would produce anti-gravity. Uh, I came in a roundabout way to the research of German flying saucers. Initially, I started a uh, should I call it an anthropological study of anti-gravity, simply collecting stories, myths, and legends about anti-gravity flying constructions from different places and times, from, uh, from academics, from tabloid sources, from ancient astronaut stories, from modern day contact accounts, from revelatory books, and so on. What's, what's the uh, most interesting story that you collected? Uh, <laughs> Actually, the most funny story that I collected was about, it came from a Russian officer, a Russian uh, lieutenant major, two-star officer, who met an extraterrestrial while walking past a Siberian lake. They invited him for a joyride, poked his brain without any pain. It was a joyride experience, not a forceful abduction. He consented to that and was extremely happy. At the end, they wanted to delete his brain because this is, well, the code of the universe. You do not leave any traces of your visitation. He didn't want to part with this pleasurable experience, so with his typical cunning Russian deceitfulness uh, of, a, of, a, of a cunning Russian peasant, he started desperately to try to find a way to deceive them. And he came with a very usual plot. What else but vodka? So she said, you know, guys, upon parting, we have a very well-established custom. We always drink with our friends. Great. So what do you drink? Well, we drink vodka. What is vodka? He had half time remained during the chemical formula of alcohol from his high school days. Then he wrote, they told him he can write with his finger on the wall of the craft and use it as a blackboard. He wrote the formula. They quickly synthesized the liquid came back with a strange looking cup, only one cup, and gave it to him. She asked him, well, wouldn't you go, uh, aren't you gonna drink with me too? And they said, oh, no, no, no. If we were to drink this liquid, we would have never reached this level of evolution that we are on right now, but you can drink it. So he quickly, quickly drank the liquid. When they put him on the bench to delete his memory, they figured, ah, came the the puzzled voice of the operator of the console, she said, I don't know what to delete. All his uh, centers of, uh, uh, of brain activity are brightly lit, obviously because of the vodka. So he just deleted whatever he thought were the memories of his abduction experience, and they were mistaken. They deleted parts of his childhood experiences. He forgot some missing months of his army service and so on, but he remembers this whole abduction and the whole joyride. And the answer to his question, well, how do flying saucers fly? He said, the said, oh, very simple. It's a spinning nuclear reactor. By dipping in and taking out the control rods, you uh, control the lift. It's one big reactor that spins along a vertical axis that creates the big lift that takes us away from the planet, and another small reactor that rotates on a horizontal axis that creates the horizontal propulsion to move us across the horizon. Uh, and many other stories, but this is probably one of the funniest stories. 
uh, of a failed, uh, how should I say, mind delusion, of a failed missing time experience. Uh, my uh, anthropological study of myths and legends about anti-gravity, spanning over several thousand years of racial history, has found one common denominator of all stories about anti-gravity myths. Namely, that simple spinning would create anti-gravity. One does not need fancy alien hardware, uh, incredible software. Uh, spinning of any material body fast enough would reduce its weight when a, cer a certain critical uh, rotation of velocity is reached, the body flies away. Then the question is how to better achieve this spinning with the existing uh, engines of the time. And this is exactly the question that the German engineers were confronted with. And basically they used every existing en uh, engine of the time. I have discovered drawings, sketches and stories of uh, flying saucer devices powered by gasoline uh, engines with propellers, powered by Vanko engines with propellers. I even have a suspicion that the very Vanko engine itself was created to power a flying saucer. We call it we call about what we call a Vanko. Vanko, yeah, the Vanko. its rotational symmetry, it can be used to spin the craft one way while the piston inside spins the other way. There is a question of balancing that I haven't figured out yet, but this is just a suspicion of mine. Beyond the internal combustion engines, the Germans used any other engines that they, uh, engine that they had. They tried uh, turbojet engines, pulse jet, ramjet engines, and rocket engines. They tried them in an outboard configuration and an in inboard configuration. Uh, we know from the history of German aviation uh You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. This is a broadcast originally recorded on July 27, 1992 in a hotel room in San Diego, California where I was uh, speaking and where Vladimir Terzisky, the person being interviewed, came to hear me speak. And uh, I actually taped four broadcasts, which were never aired, ladies and gentlemen. Have never been aired. You're hearing this material for the first time. Nobody's ever heard it before. I'm hearing it for the first time since it was taped. I have not played these since they've been taped. I can't remember why they didn't air. And uh, it's fascinating. It's interesting. I don't believe all of this stuff, and neither should you. Remember, listen to everyone, read everything, believe absolutely nothing unless you can prove it in your own research. But it's interesting. And I happen to know that Vladimir Trzyski is a very, very intelligent, very, very highly educated young man. And so uh, here's uh, part two of tonight's hour. while the piston inside spins the other way. There is a question of balancing that I haven't figured out yet, but this is just a suspicion of mine. Beyond the internal combustion engines, the Germans used any other engines that they, uh, engine that they had. Heinkel, uh, I think, 211 people fighter was built hastily in few months and it had the engine sitting on top of the fuselage. So hasty outboard engine attachment is nothing new to anyone who is well uh, aware of the advanced uh, research and development in aviation, standard aviation. Uh, later on they developed inboard engines I would mention several of the models that were built by the Germans. Actually, the first model that they built was the uh, flying saucer uh, built by Schrieder in the early 40s, 4041. It was a hybrid model between a helicopter lift and, a flying, and an anti-gravity lift. Uh, the thing looked like a giant ferris wheel 
15 meters there and about 45 feet down of the disc, spinning along a vertical axis. The cabin was in the center of the whole creation. Uh, there was perfectly stable light so that the pilots would not spin into insanity with <laughs> the whole craft. And around that cabin, we had this huge disc spinning. The, the disc had multiple helicopter propeller blades that could change their pitch in order to control for the lifting power. And uh, the information that I have is that at a time of takeoff or sharp angle high G maneuvers, the needed RPMs were around 15, 1600, while at a steady state horizontal speed or hovering, it could get by with only 600 RPM uh, per minute. Uh, this wheel was spun into action initially by turbojet engines. The Germans utilized the standard uh, Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter engine developed by uh, one of them was developed by BMW, the other one was developed by Junkers, the UMO 002 engine. Um, three engines were spinning the disc around the vertical axis and two more engines attached under the stationary cabin were propelling the whole device forward. Later on, uh, of course the first <coughs> attempt crashed because of uh, tremendous uh, wobbling and vibrations. They were not able to uh, fine tune and eliminate the vibrations of this huge spinning construction. Later on they solved the problem and the first disc reached a speed of 2,000 kilometers an hour, about uh, 1,300 miles an hour, almost twice the speed of sound. The rumor is that even Air Marshal Göring rode one of the discs. Later on, the Germans attached rocket engines, uh, particularly the Walter rocket engine, and several variations of it that increased the horizontal speed to three and subsequently 4,000 kilometers an hour, which is uh, more than three times the speed of sound. Probably these were small bursts of uh, speed because uh, my feeling is that these initial prototypes were probably made of the same dual aluminum that they were using for their standard uh, turbojet plane. Um, so if they were to push the track too hard, they would have simply melted it in the atmosphere. And in what year did this occur? Uh, the silver disc was tested from early 40s, 40, 41 until 44, 45. Later models dispensed entirely with the uh, helicopter lift and relied only on the anti-gravity lift created by the spinning hull. The very hull of the saucer was spinning. Only the cabin in the center of the craft was kept stationary by gyroscopes. And well, when you say anti-gravity, uh, Vladimir, uh, are, are you talking about something that real, uh, another force that actually opposes or negates the force of gravity, or is this just creating another energy force that... You're talking about a spinning mass yeah. creating some force that allows this to rise mm -hmm, into mm -hmm, the air. Well, uh, gravity, anti-gravity, energy, electrons, mass, these are all labels, physical variables, but these are just primitive labels that we attach to things in nature that we are trying to understand. Higher and more advanced races will probably heartily laugh at our primitive attempt, uh, more or less wrong. But uh, still, we are trying to have some clarity. My feeling is that all these labels are just convenient metaphors and tools of our mind. Uh, when I say anti-gravity, let's say that I just mean the ability to negate the pool of gravity. The ability to, without the conventional methods that we're used to, such as an airfoil or helicopter blades or something of that nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, I have to repeat that the first models, a user was hybrid models. Always, when we create something new, it would be a hybrid and would in, it would incorporate features of the old and preceding model or technology. But later on, they got rid of the helicopter aerodynamic lift propeller blade entirely for the spinning heavy mass of the 
fuselage of the body of the craft that was creating this anti-gravity lift. Uh, my feeling is that uh, when a heavy, massive object is spun around a vertical axis, it probably drags around itself the fabric of space. And modern physics would stay away from the word ether because I can send and more prove that ether doesn't exist. But the word fabric of space-time would be used, uh, or vacuum, papers on energy from Well, we know there must be some vacuum. fabric of space, because physics agrees that space can be bent. If you, uh, pull, if you can pull space, there must be something to pull. Yeah, correct. Even in, in, well, in very serious physics journals, like physical review letters and, and, and nature and other journals, we would see little by little articles about uh, getting energy from vacuum, which is probably from the fabric of space time, which is probably from evil, and very convenient labels. But my feeling is that working anti-gravity drives probably drag and spin around themselves uh, the fabric of uh, space time, creating uh, 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 an etheric Vertex, a whirlwind. So you said something that I find very interesting. You said the fabric of space time, and it's always been my contention that these machines are time machines. What do you think? Uh, a very good point. Uh, they may introduce little dv distortions in time that the, an accurate time, uh, atomic time clock would measure as a an, uh, artificial satellite that has a time atomic time clock on board would measure a little delay in time. Even a, an atomic time clock spun around the globe on a standard uh, passenger jet plane would show a little delay. So they do interfere with space time. But if you're talking about a practical time machine that would, that would take us back home, backwards or forward in time, it would take a little bit more hardware and gadgetry. But it is still easily attainable. My feeling is that these are technologies that were attained by both the Germans and uh, this uh, country's government almost half a century ago, but this would be a topic of an entirely sure. different discussion. So coming back to uh, the German flying machine, uh, the next in, an important model that was built was uh, the probably one of the most famous uh, of all models, the so-called Kugelblitz, or the crowd ball as it was jokingly called by the Allied pilots. Since or the Scout Meteor. Or Foo Fighters. Or the Foo Fighters. Uh, Foo Fighters. The name came probably from the way these machines were swooshing by many times faster than the speed of the lumbering bombers. A bomber would make three, four hundred kilometers an hour. Uh, a Messer Schmidt would make six, six fifty. Uh, a full fighter would make 1,500, 2,000, 2,900 kilometers an hour. For them, bombers were sitting ducks, even fighters were sitting ducks. So the name full fighter is a very good name. It just conveys the image of the, the idea of the situation, how fast these machines were pushing by. Renato Vesco, who is the, let's call him the Italian banner from Brown, the research and development boss of the Italian Air Force before and during the Second World War. And his brilliant book that was also kind of removed from the libraries and has been stopped from publication. The book is called Intercept But Don't Shoot or Intercept UFO, originally published in Italian and probably shortened in its British release, even more shortened in its American release. So I have a copy of this book and I read it, and he says basically the same thing that you're saying. Exactly. In his book, he, 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 he traced the whole development of anti-gravity in Germany, but he stopped short of many interesting uh, developments. He is basically talking about the lower one, two, three levels of this research and development pyramid, omitting the most interesting top levels, top tiers of research. Uh, in that but book, don't you think that, that, that in the position that he occupied with the Italian government, that it was probably wise of him to do that. Maybe he couldn't write more. What he wrote about was incredible uh, to me, and he documented every bit of it. I mean, he listed the... He knew what he was talking about. Yes, absolutely. And he's a, death, uh, a brilliant physicist and, and, and engineer. 
this is a highly technical book written in a popular language by someone who is a citizen in Asia, no doubt about that. And there he mentions about three dozen accounts of attacks of two fighters on Allied bomber formations with devastating consequences for the bombers. I mean, it was no matching game. Uh, I mean, the but these food fighters didn't really shoot at the bombers. Well, they were so advanced they didn't have to shoot. What they did was totally annihilate the electrical system. Exactly, exactly. At the beginning, they were just holding <laughs> the bombers. So the, the, the Germans were ironing out the uh, the 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 the, uh, the, 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 the following technique, the techniques of following a bomber formation without getting too close, without staying too far away. These were remote controlled weapons platform, vertical takeoff. They had remote uh, television uh, navigation, uh, remote sensing, acoustic, electromagnetic, uh, infrared sensing that were 10, 15, 20 years ahead of their time. Yes. They could automatically escape when fired upon. So when the attacks began, uh, the scuba blitzes were uh, using extremely strong electromagnetic radiation to fry the amplifiers, the receivers <coughs> of the Allied bomber radars to blind them so that they couldn't find their goals. Later on, they mounted even more powerful clip-on tubes that were creating such monstrous electromagnetic fields around them, they were comparable to the electromagnetic pulse after a nuclear bomb. These fields were powerful enough to dampen and to nullify the electrical currents in the electrical circuitry of the bombers flying nearby so that their engines would cut out because of no more sparks in the pipeline. Uh, as long as the and the moment the cooler bases would separate and fly away, the engines would restart. They would come again, the, the engines would die out. This is actually how the book uh, Genesis starts with uh, a crash of an Allied bomber after an attack by a cooler base. And this is well documented, not by, by pilots, by. Uh, by uh, I think the Kugelblitz is one of the most, besides the V-2 bomber and the, and the uh, yeah. buzz bombs, is probably yeah. the most well-documented yeah. secret yeah. weapon yeah. in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt that they had these. The Kugelblitz and the fireball, right. the two secret flying balls that were hanging like Christmas tree ornaments, like glowing orbs in the skies of Germany before they started attacking the bombers. Uh, they had a man version of the Kugelblitz. And the funny thing is that it's a very simple uh, weapon. It was a kerosene burning, a uh, turbojet powered device. Uh, I'm not sure whether they carried their oxidizer on board or not. They were either air breathing, breathing air from the atmosphere, or carrying the oxidizer on board. But basically, they used the same materials, the same fuel, <coughs> the same navigation as they were using for their fighter tanks, mm -hmm. although with incredible speed. The ionization layer around the cooler blitz was effectively uh, negating the aerodynamic resistance of the atmosphere, bringing it down to almost zero. That's why they could attain these incredible speeds even inside the atmosphere. W was the ionization layer what caused this brilliant uh, Yes, exactly. exactly. Uh, they were using some additives to the fuel that would increase the ionization coefficient. Uh, and the ionization would reduce, it would work as a lubricant around the craft, almost reducing to zero the head aerodynamic yeah. resistance. We can talk for hours about the because I have collected so much information on it. I even think that I have a very good photograph of a Kudelwitz in flight. The funny thing is that the photograph was taken in 1952 over Mount Rainier in uh, Washington State. And my suspicion is that this because this may have been tested, test flown out of the secret British research and development facility, a huge city for 50,000 people that was built in uh, Western Canada, Western Canada yeah. in uh, British Columbia. And this is the direction from which the, the first big flying saucer flap came from, the nine Flying saucer formation that right. Kenneth Arnold saw. Right. Uh, <coughs> and Renato Vesco in his book even mentions that uh, when some of these saucers that Kenneth Arnold saw crash, uh, some porous metal was found at the crash site. The porous metal what the Germans called the Luftschaum, the air foam, 
was exactly the porous metal with these microscopic, uh, micron size or whatever size, miniature size, four poles that were actually a thinner than that, yeah. smaller than that. I, I didn't mean to say behind, I meant yeah. to say yeah. honeycomb. What's yeah. honeycomb? Uh, yeah, it was actually <coughs> one of the first composite materials made with, uh, uh, tinted with uh, powder metallurgy. I mean, the Germans developed not only advanced aviation technology, but they developed powder metallurgy that was ahead of its time, and, and metals that were ahead of, of the time with more than 100 years. The so-called metal, the impervium, that was harder than diamond, uh, was developed by them and using these uh, machines later on. Uh, I heard stories that uh, a piece of imperium was held towards a diamond uh, grinding wheel or put on an electric motor, an electric diamond grinding wheel, until the wheel started glowing red hot because of the frictional temperature uh, coming out of the friction between the imperium and the wheel. But the Imperium never melted and never ever was anything grounded away from it. So these stories it was about harder than diamond. So these stories about crash burning saucers where they couldn't cut the metal and they couldn't uh, burn the metal, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, that it wasn't made here. So what, what you got described exactly, is exactly, exactly, that would exactly. exactly. that kind of. I don't want to say that all <laughs> crash crash on this planet were made by the Germans. Well, Maybe some of them were either because we don't we didn't know that. But we do know. But we do know exactly. that we have developed exactly. this technology. But uh, the whole set of technologies needed for a crash this scenario or even a little gray abduction scenario were uh, created by the Germans 50 years ago and have been in the government arsenal of all superpowers for half a century. Sure. So going back to the German disc, uh, after the Kudelbrist and the Feuerbach, which is the late, the second version of the Kudelbrist, and it was the main version, the Germans developed, uh, which, uh, the, uh, uh, their first and large drone, the mega project, the Belong to Meetish Fever Disc, which was their first operational fighter saucer. Uh, it was a standard turbojet craft. Uh, well, a thermal jet saucer uh, using low-grade aviation kerosene. At the end of the war, the Germans had a very low-grade gas. I mean, they were running on octane numbers that <laughs> few Allied machines would ever move. Uh, it turned out to be a boom for everyone because jet fuel, uh, because of that, yeah. eventually turned out to be nothing more than a version of kerosene. Exactly, and it's non-explosive. It's right. a lot less explosive than gasoline. Otherwise, we would have had a lot more Kinderbunk type uh, crashes of uh, airplanes. Yeah. Uh, so the Belongso meter shiver disc was again a disc about 15 meters diameter, about 45 feet diameter. At the beginning, they tried eight uh, turbo jets engines of the UMO, uh, I think, 002 type, the standard uh, jets used in the Messerschmitt 262 fighter plane. Uh, and it was for the benefit of our listeners, was the first fighter plane. Turbojet, right. uh, operational turbojet fighter plane. Actually, the Heinzel 179 was the first turbojet plane that ever took off. It happened in the summer of 1939. Uh, three, four years before the first British. This is very incredible that the, 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 the first jet powered aircraft took off in 1939. Exactly. But operational jet aircraft weren't in the air actually fighting until almost the, the very end of the war. Uh, well, let me ask you something that they didn't. for research. Sure. I mean, the, 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 the fighter planes of the Second World War, the Messerschmitt, They've been developed for 10 years before that. But look at the Japanese. I bet the Japanese, if they'd have had that, they wouldn't spend time for research because they were sending pilots up in the air to go to their death as, as the guidance system for bombs. Uh, the pilot actually was the guidance system for flying bombs that they would just uh, fly right into uh, our ships. I agree, but still so they had extensive research before the war too, and they got a lot of information from the Germans including up to the very last months of the war, even after the war ended in Germany, they were still getting, with the huge German transport submarines, bizarre flying contractions, including 
uh, disassembled uh, flying saucer that were assembled mm -hmm. according to an eyewitness account of a Japanese engineer that worked for a Mitsubishi uh, uh, aircraft factory. They assembled a strange device, pushed the button, it flew away, they got so scared they dynamited the other device, <laughs> or, or that is what they said, uh, uh, said their prayers, and <laughs> this was the end of uh, the journey. Yeah, the end of it. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, uh, I, I, can't, I can't see the Japanese getting scared and running away, but that's okay. Uh, no, you, you're raising a very valid question why it took so long for the turbojet to be developed. You know, I mean, the first turbojet plane was probably a 10 minute flight, uh, 10 days repair situation, or maybe a month of repair. Sure. Well, I, I was saying the biggest, the biggest problem was like being able to carry enough fuel to stay in the air for uh, long enough to, to get to it. No, no, I don't feel, I mean, everything would be leaking. Uh, uh, the gas turbine would, uh, would would wear down very fast. The ball bearings would melt, and so on. Uh, these things could hardly stay in the air for 15 minutes without developing any trouble. While well, the piston fighters could fight for hours without major failures because they had already, from uh, well, first World War 19 whatever 1914, uh, about what is it? About 25 years of. Uh, extensive history. I've got to, to interrupt, you know, uh, this is fascinating. I've got to tell you, this is absolutely fascinating, and I know that our listeners are, are just as fascinated as I am, and uh, uh, I know an awful lot a, about this, but still... It's the tip of the iceberg. We right. haven't even cracked And uh, what we're going to do is, would you consent to come back and do maybe one or two more shows, and then so that we can... Oh, we're very interested to this. Great. Uh, I uh, can't tell you how, how happy uh, it makes me to have someone who has this kind of knowledge on this show. Um, it's, it's something that everybody needs to understand, that technology has been developed in secret and withheld from the common man for so many years that a lot of, well, for instance, in the United States right now, every year the United States government spends 90 billion, that's billion with a mm -hmm. billion, dollars on research. On, where? on black project research and another 30 billion on black project research. And where is the results of all of this research over the years? And how much of the drug money proceeds go to black project research too? And the printing press funny money going to black project research too? One of my favorite subjects. Well, we can't continue it on tonight, so uh, as always, dear listeners, good night, and God bless you all. I hear that five years ago when it was taped. <laughs> I should have. I can tell you that right now. Uh, that was uh, incredible, interesting stuff. And uh, there's three more hours of it. I think we're just going to plug that in for the next three Friday nights. Now, don't get Vladimir wrong. He does believe in extraterrestrials, and uh, maybe some of that will come out. I truly don't remember, ladies and gentlemen, but whatever comes out will come out. And I guarantee that whatever it is, you will be held spellbound, fascinated, and uh, you'll be entertained and educated all at the same time. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, listen to everybody, read everything, believe absolutely nothing unless you can prove it in your own research. And that goes for what you hear from me, your mother, your priest, your teacher, your professor, the president of the United States, the local police chief, I don't care who it is. You prove it yourself. <laughs> there are so many people telling so many lies that it's 
absolutely pathetic. I think what you've heard tonight is closer to the truth than anything you've ever heard regarding advanced technology and uh, UFOs and flying saucers and all of those kinds of things. Until Monday, good night, folks. God bless each and every single one of you. and it's tolling for you. And I advise you to listen. You're listening to the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. We now return you to all oldies most of the time. Classic radio, like you always wished it could be.